All right, so welcome to the final talk of this conference. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Amir Mohamedi from the University of California, San Diego, who will tell us about finitary analysis in homogeneous dynamics. All yours, Amir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great honor to be here and uh, give this talk. This being the last talk, I think we should all thank the organizers and the support team for this great conference. So. Uh, <clears throat> with that, maybe I'll get to the talk. This is a half hour talk, so I'll try to be brief, maybe even finish before half hour so we can be ready for festivities. Uh, like he said, I want to talk about quantitative aspects of flows on homogeneous spaces. This has already appeared at least in two of the talks, Hio's talk and just Nimish's talk just before this. So I would like to start with the following celebrated conjecture of Raghunathan proved by Ratner uh, that if you have a Lie group and you have a lattice in this Lie group, a discrete subgroup with finite covolume, then we would like to understand orbits of every point uh, under subgroups of G. Of course, this is hopeless if I took the subgroup to be if I took G to be SL2R and the subgroup to be the diagonal group, then we know that this action is Bernoulli and there is uh, no hope to understand uh, for understanding every orbit. But the fundamental conjecture and fundamental theorem of Ratner says that the situation is drastically different if you assume your group is generated by uh, unipotent elements. And unipotent elements are those elements that uh, all the eigenvalue, all the complex eigenvalues are. One. So there is strong rigidity that we understand uh, closure of every single orbit, and they're all uh, proper submanifolds. So they are all actually orbits of intermediate subgroups. The example to have in mind, which is actually uh, in some sense <clears throat> for applications, number theoretical applications, perhaps the uh, case of main interest is GSLNR or its friends and gamma uh, SLNZ or analogs in arithmetic setting. And the group W, uh, one parameter subgroup, which is obtained by exponentiating some nilpotent element. So this is, if you haven't thought about this type of question, this is just to have in mind. So you can take W to basically be one, 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 T, zero, zero, or if you like more generic type elements, uh, these two would do and n equals three. So these are the type of <clears throat> groups we are talking about. Now, prior to Ratner's uh, work, important special cases of this in the context of Oppenheim conjecture were proved by Margulis and Daniel Margulis uh, using different methods. Ratner's proof went through measure classification and then she used <clears throat> linearization techniques developed by Danny Margulis uh, and also uh, versions that she adapted herself to uh, go from measures to orbit closure. But there was, a, there was an approach actively pursue, uh, being pursued by Margulis and Danny Margulis, which used purely topological arguments to prove this topological version. I'll come back to this later in the talk. And around the same time that <clears throat> Ratner's theorems were, uh, well, appeared. Nimish had uh, also studied quotients of SON bond with lattices and unipotent flows here. This, I think, appeared in Hio's talk yesterday. She mentioned this work as well. So that's one remark I wanted to make. Uh, well, this is not in, <clears throat> so what I've written here, historically, these are, this should have been switched, but I just wanted to go in that direction. The case uh, that is classical somehow is when W is a big subgroup of your group G. Think about G being SL2 and W being the upper triangular, strictly upper triangular group, or more generally G being SLNR and W being a full group of upper triangular groups. So these groups are called porospheric subgroup because they can be, okay, they can be contracted to identity using <clears throat> some uh, non-trivial element in your group and they're all the elements that can be contracted. So they are somehow 
in the language of smooth dynamics, if you want, these are stable or unstable leaf for some uh, flow, full stable or unstable leaf for some flow. And the study of <clears throat> this type of rigidity result for these groups has even a longer history. Already in the 30s, Hedlund understood what happens in dimension two. So the picture is very explicit. If this is your copy of H2, which I've drawn in ball model, and the horosphere is a circle, which is tangent to the boundary, then when you project to your manifold, which is H2 mod gamma, okay, if the manifold is compact, then you have minimality. Every single orbit is gonna be dense. If the manifold is not compact and you have a cusp, of course, you can't expect to have minimality because cusp, boundary of cusp is a closed horosphere, horosphere cycle in this case. And, but what Hedlund shows is that that's it. You're either closed or dense. And these, uh, this picture is very, uh, somehow very complete. Like I said, this is in <clears throat> sharp contrast with the case of geodesics. If you take a geodesic and project it, the only obstruction you have really is dimension. You can attain any Hausdorff dimension between one and two for the closure. So it's a very different story there. Uh, now, I am going to be focusing on groups that are generated by unipotence or groups that are very close to groups being generated by unipotence, but it needs to be mentioned that uh, cases of other groups, groups, uh, higher rank abelian groups or uh, random walks by non-amenable groups, as well as going beyond the homogeneous space and looking at maybe SL2R action on the space of uh, on the modular space of compact human surfaces, these have been extensively studied with fantastic results and which have been celebrated by many awards, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to. So if I were to list the names here, I think uh, that would be the talk, just list of people who have worked on these problems. But okay, so let me just <clears throat> leave it at that. Uh, and just going back to Hio's talk, the condition that gamma is a lattice is quite important in all of what I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, a natural question is how necessary it is. Of course, we saw yesterday that it is necessary. Nevertheless, there are classes of, uh, classes of manifolds that this can be lifted. And this is also a fascinating direction that uh, one would like to understand this type of rigidity result. And our knowledge is basically restricted to horospheric case, except the cases that he talked about. So <clears throat> that is uh, maybe history of this part that I wanted to talk about. Like I said, I have left many names, uh, left out many names, but my apologies. It's, uh, somehow it's this area has been around for some, I don't know. 40 years or something, 50 years maybe now. And it's very difficult to just cover all the names in a half hour talk. But the aspect that I want to somehow focus on is what's missing from these fantastic results. And what is missing is the quantitative aspect of the questions. Of course, it, if you want to look at the hierarchy of the results, one thing that I should have mentioned, but okay, now maybe I can mention, the, I emphasize that the important, the somehow power of Ratner's theorem is that it gives you information about every orbit. If you were satisfied with information about almost every, in presence of ergodicity, this is somehow, this is a, well, you can call it a trivial exercise, uh, using ergodic theorem or just using somehow second countability of the space to show that you have almost every point behaves the way you want it to. But Ratner's theorem tells you statement, gives you a statement about every point. And beyond, unique ergo, uh, beyond uniquely ergodic systems, this is really the only example that we have information about every point. Of course, uh, I, I mentioned these other works, but they are all Ratner type results that they give you information about every point. So now, so Ratner went from almost every to every. The question I'm asking is that, okay, we have information about every, this is great. It's had many applications, but uh, is it possible to somehow have finer information? Is it possible to have effective accounts 
uh, on these density results. What's the rate that I'm going to fill up my <clears throat> closure? This is the question I want to ask. And this question uh, was already, I'm not the first person to ask it, this question was already uh, asked in Margulis's 1990 Kyoto uh, ICM talk that he poses this question as one of the challenging directions to go forward. And I hope to somehow report on some of the progress that has happened around this problem in past 30 years or so. Uh, first, a word of caution is that usually such a result is going to be difficult to state and it's going to depend on delicate properties of both your acting group and the point you started. Already you see this in uh, for rotations on a circle. I've drawn a uh, continuous example of this. If you want to take rotations on a circle, the angle, the irrationality of this angle enters uh, the picture on how fast you will equidistribute on the circle. If you have a Diophantine angle, you will equidistribute fast. If you have something that is a Liouville number, if you're very close to being approximated with rational numbers of bigger and bigger denominators, then it will take you forever to, it will take me forever to become equidistribute <clears throat> in the circle. And here's a <clears throat> continuous example of this in two torus because I said W was connected, just a connected example. This line, is very close to the horizontal line, which has a periodic orbit. So if I think about epsilon as being very small and I only go till half the time that this will reach height one, what I see in the torus is that I'm only uh, filling up half of the torus. So first, there are two things I want to mention about this example. Well, it, it tells you that if you're close to a periodic orbit, it will take a long time to be equidistributed, to be dense. Uh, secondly, it tells you that you can't hope that the entire life happens near one closed orbit. You must allow families of closed orbits that maybe, so you spend some time near this and then you go spend some time near the other one, but these come in some sort of a, uh, if you want, tubes of <clears throat> uh, these kind of subgroups. So that's, these are the two things I want to mention about this. All right. So now what is known? The case of new, when the ambient group itself is unipotent, so the case of the torus included, uh, this was beautifully answered by Green and Tao, where they actually prove polynomial rates for distribution or density of these of, uh, orbits, actually discrete times, even polynomial times they take. And <clears throat> But the methods there are somehow restricted to unipotent uh, groups. They use induction, they use some van der Korpet trick argument. So they use induction on the unipotency of the group to prove this. And it's, there, there are techniques that just somehow are, they stop if you leave the unipotent world. Uh, the case that I'm going to be focusing on mainly is what happens for semi-simple groups. So that is the case that is going to be the main concern here. Uh, again, these results I'm stating are not in chronological order. I've just listed them in an order that I hope will make the talk easier to follow. So Lyndon Strauss and Margulis proved a, an effective version of the Oppenheim conjecture in dimension three. And what they show is that the, so Oppenheim conjecture says that if I give you a ternary form, uh, ternary quadratic form, non-degenerate and irrational, not being a multiple of a rational form, then for every epsilon you give me, I can find you uh, an integral solution. I can find you some vector in Z3 so that the value of the quadratic form is less than epsilon. So the natural question is how big of a vector do I need? Already know that for <clears throat> indefinite rational forms, Castle had these bounds on <clears throat> the size of the solu smallest solution you have, this is uh, for irrational. And what they prove is this beautiful result that if you assume your form is the diophantine, think about a form that's not a multiple of a rational form, but one of the coefficients is square root of two, that type of form. Then for every epsilon, you can find the solution and the solution has a bound. So the size of the solution is exponential of one over epsilon to power n, n is an absolute constant. 
So there's an absolute constant that for a diaphragm time <clears throat> point you give me, I can uh, solve this <clears throat> diaphragm time inequality like this, how, for provided that epsilon is small enough. And this, how small this initial epsilon should be, this depends on diaphragm time properties of your point, the degree of the <clears throat> uh, coefficient, et cetera. Okay, so this is uh, one beautiful result. As you see, we don't quite get the rate that maybe uh, now we know actually for a typical form. For a typical form, you need you are going to have a polynomial rate. This was, well, at least I know of two works that they will give this, Atria and Margulis, and works of Duby, Kelmer, and Anish Ghosh. Uh, that you you will get a polynomial rate for a typical form. Also, Borgan showed that for typical form in a one-dimensional family of uh, quadratic form, in a certain one-dimensional family, you get a polynomial rate. But what one gets here is uh, this type of <coughs> exponent of a polynomial. And this works somehow, uh, so builds on this topological approach of Daniel Margulis that I mentioned we, that topological approach utilized a notion of minimal sets. Of course, minimal sets are not effective, but there's an effective replacement by this, uh, which is this linearization technique of Danny and Margulis. And that is somehow what is done here. If you just do that, the rate you're gonna get here is gonna be worse than this. You're gonna have X pop X pop this. Uh, another ingredient, uh, another novel ingredient in this work is some combinatorial lemma, which actually <clears throat> takes care of one exponent and you get this. In an ongoing joint work with <clears throat> Nuno Shah, Margulis and Shah, we prove actually a full-blown effective version uh, for this, for flow, unipotent flows on arithmetic quotient. The rates we get are quite bad. If this is one exponent here, Imagine that you're going to have x pop, x pop, x pop, uh, one over epsilon n, and the number of x you need uh, depends on the dimension. So the higher the dimension, the slower the rate of equity distribution. But given the current technology, I mean, with the current technology, and in this generality, this seems to be somehow uh, what one can do without introducing new somehow techniques. If you want to take uh, Danny Margulis's proof and try to effectivize it. This is a tedious work. It's challenging. And what you're going to get is a rate of this sort. I, it somehow doesn't seem possible that just effectivizing existing proofs will give you uh, better rates. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want to talk about. Uh, whether we know better rates in semi-simple setting. As I already mentioned, uh, Green and Tau proved polynomially uh, effective density result in the case of unipotent groups. Now, how about in the case of semi-simple groups? Some results are known. Uh, the action of horospheric groups, which I mentioned, were classical in the, in the qualitative world, works of Hedlund, Danny, and <clears throat> Furstenberg. Uh, in this case, also, they, they are very well understood. They are well adapted to techniques from harmonic analysis, decay of matrix coefficients, mixing rates, whatever you want to call it. Different people have a strong opinion on uh, how to call these techniques. And there is extensive literature on this. This is again just a uh, some list of people who have worked on this. Margulis's thesis, <clears throat> Sarnax, what I what I thought was Sarnax's thesis, but I may be wrong here. Uh, Berger's work and <clears throat> several other works. They address this case of horospherical uh, group. There is an asterisk there for Strombergson's work. Strombergson has certainly worked on the horospherical group case and has probably the sharpest results one has. But uh, another theorem of Strombergson's, which needs to be mentioned, is the case of semi-direct product. He's also proved the result about SL2R semi-direct R2 and the acting group being the, 
the one that projects into horospheric in SL2. And this is, okay, this is beyond horospheric case. It's closely related to horospheric, but it's beyond horospheric case. And these <clears throat> works here uh, are related to translations of symmetric groups. These also, many, many people have worked on in this direction as well. These symmetric groups are somehow because of polar decomposition and it was about decomposition, they're close to be to horospheric groups. So algebra helps there. And one can show that if you translate these in a direction that you increase the volume, you have effective results. <clears throat> a <clears throat> fundamental contribution was made by uh, Einzelder, Margulis, and Venkatesh. This is, I think, um, maybe 2007, 2008, uh, where they study periodic orbits of semi-simple groups in quotients by arithmetic groups. And they prove a polynomially effective EQ distribution. It's polynomial in the volume of the orbit. And <clears throat> somehow you need some conditions on these uh, groups, okay? No compact factors. And somehow the group that you are acting with is fixed in this original work, we were able to, in a follow-up work, lift some of these conditions. The new ingredients that they were needed were, <clears throat> this is the conference at Tata, so were Prasad's uh, volume formula and the fundamental work of Borel Prasad that went to removing some of these conditions. But there is a reason that one gets a uh, polynomial right here. And the reason is this strong deep input from number theory that of uh, uniform spectral gap that when you look at all these periodic orbits, they are congruence quotients, and then you have property tau. So you have a uniform spectral gap, which you can use to get a, an effective ergodic theorem. And when you have an effective, uh, effective ergodic theorem, then you can somehow <clears throat> try to build on that. Uh, an important direction that is remaining in here is to allow for the acting group to have centralizers. This will have applications in number theory, which, okay, that seems to be quite technical and still remaining open. That is in there. There is very important work, especially for what is going to follow. This work is important on its own, but it's also, it's even more important for the remainder of this talk is the work of <clears throat> Borgian, Furman, Lunen, Strauss, and Moses, where they study random walks on torus and they get effective EQ distribution results here. The techniques there are quite different from the techniques I mentioned here. They, so they use <clears throat> some projection theorems of uh, Borgan and theory of random matrices. And well, because it's a torus, they also use Fourier analysis, but uh, it is, the, the, the techniques are quite important for what is to follow. Okay, so this is uh, some brief list of <clears throat> polynomial rates that are known in the context of homogeneous dynamics, or at least the polynomial no, uh, bounds I know of in the context of uh, uh, homogeneous dynamics. People should correct me if I have left out something. So <clears throat> as you see, non-periodic orbits of subgroups which are not horospheric, we don't have any uh, polynomial estimates yet. So the case I mentioned, the uh, joint work with uh, Lunar, Strauss, Margulis, and Shaw uh, is about general orbits, but the rates we get are far from uh, polynomial. The rates you get are uh, rather weak. So, I want to concentrate on this very explicit example. You can take either one of these two groups, whichever you like. So SL2C or SL2 times SL2 and gamma is a lattice. And I want to fix the, a copy of SL2R, a copy of SL2R inside G. Of course, in SL2C, it's clear what I mean by a copy of SL2R in, SL2 times SL2, there are three copies, but two of them are normal. So you can imagine that I'm not interested in those. Study of those reduces to horospheric cases. It's, it's not very, that is not very interesting. The, the interesting case is the case of a maximal subgroup, which is this diagonally embedded copy of SL2R. And I'm going to fix the 
uh, Borel subgroup, the upper triangular uh, subgroup in H. Of course, you can complain that I said groups are generated by unipotents, and this one is not, but this is very closely related. We already saw uh, what Nimish was discussing was these expanding translates of horror spheres. So it's, uh, this is of that case, and uh, maybe more using more algebraic terms. These are, this is an epimorphic group in H, and already I think in early 90s, Shachar uh, observed that if you have an epimorphic group, orbits of epimorphic groups, uh, of, so orbits of P are the same as orbits of H using Ratner's theorem. So there, it's very closely related to H. Indeed, H is non-amenable, and if you want to understand orbits of H, you better work with an amenable subgroup of it. It's somehow you're you're just forced to do that because if you fix uh, a ball in H and you move this ball with the random elements, this is going to go in the direction of P. It's there's just nothing you can. Do. So one way or another, you need to study this P action and. The theorem I want to discuss is the following joint work with Lauren Linder Strauss that if you assume gamma is arithmetic, and I will come back to this, then we have a polynomial density result. What is this saying? Okay, it's, it's a mouthful to read. Like I said, and we already saw for a rational rotation of a circle, it could be that I'm stuck near a small rational subspace. So case two you see here is being near small rational subspace. Case one is the interesting case, which is density. So what this is saying is that you give me a point and I want to apply ball of radius R in P in the group of upper triangular matrices to this point. And I want to ask whether this is polynomially dense, whether I get R to power minus epsilon close to every point. The statement is that yes, unless you're too close to small orbit of the SL2 that I discussed. So you're either polynomially dense or there's an obstruction and the obstruction is explicit and algebraic. It's a small volume orbit of the group H. That's what the theorem says. Now maybe we can go uh, through it and try to see what the parameters are. So this, you give me delta. Delta is supposed to say what complexity of rational points you're allowing me. You, pour, you give me x0 and you give me t, which is large. Now, either I'm dense, of course, x is not compact. I can't hope to be dense in all of x. I need to cut some big compact part of x, and this is what that is. If x is compact, you can just put x to be uh, this to be all of X, when X is not compact, I cut out the cost at a certain height. So either I come within T to power minus epsilon of every point in this thick part, or I am close, I'm very close to a uh, small orbit of, small periodic orbit of H. So that's what the theorem says, okay? So, <clears throat> The proof uh, uses ideas from additive combinatorics, uh, broadly speaking. So we use uh, some tools from incident geometry uh, and we use extensively Margulis functions in our arguments. There is, so I, I, I'm not sure I will have time to get to the maybe slightly uh, more in depth discussion of the proof, but the, the proof will have three stages. So the stage one is some initial randomness, which we get using arithmeticity. I should mention here that I said I was going to mention a word about arithmeticity, but I somehow didn't. If you don't want to take the group gamma to be arithmetic, you need to modify the statement rather than being near a periodic orbit you should replace this by your near a point which has large stabilizer. So it has a stabilizer which is non-elementary and it's generated, which is non-elementary. And inside the stabilizer, I can find the small elements. That's somehow the payoff for arithmeticity. But anyway, we use arithmeticity to get some initial randomness. 
then we need to this is this gives some small dimension you need to bring this dimension to a dimension that is useful for spectral purposes and that's where we use uh, margulis function there's a bootstrapping step where we use margulis functions and then in the end we use uh, decay of correlations in the space x to conclude hopefully if there's time i will <clears throat> uh, we will see these slides about this but so I said I somehow the main point of this project was to prove something about non periodic orbits, but the methods apply to periodic orbits also. And the advantage they have is that for periodic orbits, you don't need arithmeticity. Periodic orbits, and they, they are somehow arithmetic by nature because two rational points can't get close to each other, two periodic orbits can't get cl too close to each other. This uh, there are different ways to, of seeing this, but maybe the one elegant way to see this is using, again, Margulis functions. This is an argument due to Margulis that shows that periodic orbits cannot get close to each other without assuming arithmeticity. Okay, so it applies to periodic orbits also, and the bounds we get are rather, so they depend on rather weak properties, uh, coarse properties of your space. The mixing rate, the volume and injectivity radius of the core. And what good does this do for us? Because if, so we all heard uh, David Fisher's talk yesterday that somehow in all these examples I'm discussing, either you are arithmetic or there's only finitely many closed orbits. So it's a theorem about finitely many closed orbits, but it can also help to give a bound on how many, at least in some cases. And this is this application I want to mention. And then maybe I know I'm going over the, my time with a minute or so, but uh, I'll mention this application and then stop. So these examples appeared yesterday in David's talk that you have these hybrid manifolds. Uh, constructed by Gromov and Piotrowski Shapiro, you have two, three manifolds, both of them arithmetic, but non-commensurable. And you have some surface, uh, which is <clears throat> the same surface in both of them, in a sense. So you have sub-manifolds of M1 and M2, and these have boundaries, which are isomorphic to each other. And these sub-manifolds have the risky dense fundamental groups, these sub-manifolds with boundaries. Then I can cut open M1, I can cut open M2. These examples appeared in Hugo's talk also. These manifolds with Fuchsian ends are what you get when you cut this open and don't close it. You just let it become a flare. Then you can cut it open and glue them together. You get a new arithmetic three manifold, okay? And as David mentioned, so this is a more detailed discussion of how to construct this. Let me skip that. As David mentioned, it was proved by <clears throat> Fisher, Lafond, Miller, and Stover that there's only finitely many periodic orbits in here. This goes through an angle rigidity result, which was proved by them and independently by Benoit and O, which says if you have a closed orbit, it needs to intersect this surface, the surface in the middle, in an orthogonal angle. So it needs to be perpendicular. Using this and our effective density, we can say how many periodic orbits you can have. As you see, the number is polynomial in terms of the geometry of your three manifold. So maybe I'll stop there. I am sorry to have gone over time. Not at all. So let's thank Amir for the really lovely talk. That was fantastic. Are there any questions for? Uh, it's, not, it's not a question. Uh, I want to apologize to Amir for the disturbance caused at the beginning of his lecture because I'd forgotten to unmute. I've forgotten to mute my mic. Sorry about it. And Sorry. thank you for your very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any any other questions? So I mean, I just had a small confusion. So this uh, this result of yours um, and the previous this uh, Einsiedler Margulis Venkatesh. So what were the groups and the things? I just got confused. In... Oh yeah. So the group you have a semi-simple group. Yeah. 
uh, you have a semi-simple group and then you have a semi-simple subgroup of it. Oh, I see, and I see, I understand. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But right. it's somehow this second result is in a delic setting and yes. there is no splitting condition somehow that is the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Amir once more for a lovely talk. Thank you.